the third panel is uh, Toward a New Christian Theology of Martyrdom, Repentance, and Place. Our speakers will be Jeremy Burgeon, Preston Parsons, and Ryan Turnbull. Uh, we're going to have the three speakers present their papers and have questions towards the end. And we'll begin with uh, Jeremy Burgeon, who is Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Theological Studies at Conrad Grable University at the University of Waterloo. He's a past president of the CTS. So over to you, Jeremy. All right, thank you. Um, and I have just uh, put in the chat uh, a land acknowledgement. Uh, and also as I begin here, I just want to also uh, note that I will be making some references to sexual violence. The title of my paper is um, uh, Christian Martyrdom, Cultural Trauma and Conspiracies of Silence. In Antwerp, 1573, Macon Vence was publicly burned at the stake as an Anabaptist and therefore a heretic. She had been imprisoned for weeks and tortured to renounce her particular faith. Before she was brought to the stake, a tongue screw was inserted into her mouth to prevent her from preaching during her final moments. After her death, her two young sons sifted through the ashes to recover that tongue screw, which has been reverently, reverently preserved by the Dutch Mennonites. The story and an etching of her sons searching for the tongue screw is included in the martyr's mirror, the Anabaptist martyrology, which places her in a long line of Christian martyrs from Christ and Stephen to those of the early church through to the Anabaptists. Her death is narrated as an instance of martyrdom and thus uh, shows the great reversals of martyrdom. Weakness is strength, apparent defeat is victory, Death is true life. Her persecutors attempted to silence her with a tongue screw, but as a martyr, she has triumphed over them and borne a witness that speaks throughout the ages nevertheless. And so in the Anabaptist tradition, Macon is a martyr who thereby exemplifies Christian discipleship. She instructs and inspires. But this narrative, I wanna suggest, is problematic for, among other reasons, how Christians think about victims, which is another way we might identify Macon. I'm working on a larger project in which I assess the claim that Christian martyrdom, in the words of Pope Francis, is an ecumenism of blood, which advances the unity of the church. That basic argument asserts that the martyr adheres to Christ in life and death, and thus transcends the historical separations that have arisen between Christians. I won't digress too much here, but just to say that the ecumenism of blood thesis is part of a wider theological discourse that regards memories of martyrdom as a constructive theological resource for ethics, for ecclesiology, for the witness of the church, and also for ecumenism. In my project, I wrestle with the fact that framing particular deaths as martyrdom can often foster certain kinds of unity, including problematic forms that are in fact inimical to true Christian unity. One obvious example is that of confessional martyrs killed by other Christians, as Macon Venz was. Her legacy has fostered Anabaptist identity and unity, but implicitly and sometimes explicitly at the expense of denouncing Roman Catholicism as false. But for the purpose of my reflections here, I wanna consider how discourses of martyrdom may function to silence victims, even despite the ostensible claims to amplify them. And so I turn to the discourse of trauma. Now there is an important and often missed distinction between the sociological and the psychoanalytical approaches to trauma, or between trauma's claimed and unclaimed experiences as biblical scholar, uh, biblical scholar David Jansen puts it. In the psychoanalytical approach, which has been influentially developed by Judith Herman and in the literary field by Kathy Carruth, traumatic experiences are not fully known or accessible to those who experience them. They may be unintegrated and thus unclaimed. By contrast, in the sociological approach developed by Jeffrey Alexander and Ron Ironman, the focus is not on the primary victims per se, 
but rather on how a larger community frames the meaning of what victims underwent. Meaning is thus claimed by the larger story that is told, into which personal experiences are ostensibly integrated, perhaps over-integrated. For example, the 9-11 attacks were experienced as cultural trauma in North America, even by those who may have had no direct connection to immediate victims, because it al altered our sense of the world and our place in it, construed it as an attack on, quote, us and our way of life, and oriented collective responses. Jeffrey Alexander puts it this way, Cultural trauma occurs when members of a collective feel they have been subjected to a horrendous event that leaves indelible marks upon their group consciousness, marking their memories forever and changing their future identity in fundamental and irrevocable ways, end quote. He notes that this future identity is typically lim linked with some moral responsibility, a call to particular collective action. So you can see how in the field of biblical studies, for example, the lens of cultural trauma might help us to understand the catastrophic fall of Jerusalem and the Babylonian exile, how that came to be interpreted uh, and integrated into a larger narrative, not an ending, but an event of divine judgment and a call to repentance. It's also evident how this framework might help us understand how early Christian communities in the Roman Empire, which experienced occasional sporadic and often localized persecution, came to frame their experiences in terms of martyrdom, to understand it as a test and a confirmation of faithfulness, and to identify with other and to identify with other Christians who lived with similar fears. Now, with respect to early Anabaptism, we can only speculate on the psychological states of Macon Venz and her children who witnessed her death and dug in her ashes. But the sociological perspective on trauma may help us to understand how a much wider community took up that story and placed it in the martyr's mirror. And how that community, which is to some extent constituted and unified by this martyr narrative and others, comprehends the meaning of this suffering, makes judgments about the admirable ways certain persons respond to suffering, and recommends similar responses to members of the group. This is an ambivalent legacy. Suffering for the faith is bred in the bone of Christian faith, one centered on the cross, absolutely. But there is also a shadow side, insofar as it can valorize suffering as redemptive, demand victims accept their lot as a spiritual opportunity. It can lock down a narrative in ways that marginalize or exclude experiences that may not fit. It can silence the voices of victims, their doubts, their choices to avoid suffering. The saintly status of martyrs means that we often place upon them assumptions about how they must have navigated their ordeals, which may reflect our projections more than their own experiences. A powerful story illuminates, but it also hides. Now, in a series of articles over the past two decades, theologian David Toombs has invited consideration of whether Jesus experienced sexual assault. The Gospels attest to his public stripping, which is an instance of sexual humiliation. Yet, Toombs, as Toombs shows from cross-disciplinary studies of state-sponsored torture and execution, Sexual assault of victims, female and male, is widespread. The rape of male prisoners was common in the Roman world. And while we can't be sure what Jesus experienced, Toombs writes, quote, to say that Jesus would not have been vulnerable to the worst abuses of human power is to deny that he was truly human at all, end quote. Toombs further reflects on his experience of talking with various audiences about this dimension of the Jesus story. Some recoil, some deny, and many report being shocked that they never noticed or considered something which in retrospect was there all along, hidden in plain sight. Was there a conspiracy of silence that directed attention away from sexual violence? If Jesus' death on the cross is understood as a cultural trauma, and a powerful narrative arose to give meaning to those who remained, we might wonder how that narrative might exclude from consideration particular dimensions of experience. 
And what effect does this have on how other victims and their communities who might identify with the story of Jesus understand and respond to suffering? To conclude, I'm not suggesting that we imagine what Macon Vance might say had her voice not been silenced by a tongue screw. That is in the past. But let us also not so quickly race to assume the tongue screw as a token of victory, but recognize it in its horror and our complicity in the horror of silencing victims. There is a need to affirm what I would call a Catholicity of human experience in the church, but also the need to not assume in advance that we, whoever we are, know what those experiences are like. We are continuing to learn what the Catholic body of Christ, in all senses, has undergone and undergoes. The martyr trope reveals and it conceals. It proclaims and it silences. It is important, therefore, to recognize how we tell stories, that how we tell stories about martyrs may in fact work in ways that continue to silence victims, despite what the narrative logic of martyrdom may tell us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, Preston Parsons recently completed his doctoral thesis, uh, Friendship for Others, Juan, Offer, and Berta, on the theology and practice of friendship. His other theological interests engage the experience and treatment of chronic pain, the Roman Catholic fiction writer Flannery O'Connor, and the Protestant reception of Joseph Ratzinger's theology. He's a member of the International Pentecostal Anglican Ecumenical Dialogue, teaches occasionally at Martin Luther University College, and serves as the rector of an Anglican parish in Kitchener, Ontario. Over to you, Preston. Thank you. Um, and uh, before I begin, I, I will at least briefly be speaking uh, specifically about some residential school trauma. Uh, indigenous Anglican leaders have been calling for the repentance of the church for its involvement in residential schools for some time now. It's a call that has even greater urgency as the violence that took place in residential schools comes to greater public awareness. This is increasingly a time of the church's reckoning from within and without. This call for repentance, however, opens up a set of questions. Can the church in the present repent for the unrepentant perpetrators of residential school abuse? In what sense is the church still guilty? Uh, what if only some members of the church were willing to repent in the present? And essentially, the question that my uh, research seeks to answer is this, is can we repent for others? My overview of this research project, which I'm presenting now, will proceed as follows. Section one summarizes the call to repentance and pertinent contextual elements to that call to repentance. Section two offers a survey of Bonhoeffer's understanding of repentance and response in dialogue with the contextual elements of section one. And I'll end my presentation with a few remarks and questions about next steps for this research project, which is very much uh, in media res. So section one, residential schools, the call to repentance and settler moves to innocence. Between 1820 and 1969, the Anglican Church of Canada ran about three dozen residential schools. After confederation in 1867, the church partnered with the state in running them. This was a project that intended to quote, get rid of the Indian problem through assimilation. At the schools, children died at alarming rates through lack of healthcare and safe housing and by suicide. Residential schools were also centers of abuse at the hands of members of the Anglican clergy. Not far from me here stands the Mohawk Institute, or as it is otherwise known, the Mush Hole, opened in 1831. It was owned and run by the New England Company with an Anglican clergyman as principal. By 1922, it was managed by the Canadian government, but keeping the agreement about Anglican clergymen as principal. Through its history, there were prison cells the size of closets and children tortured by electrocution, among other abuses. The last principal and a man of living memory was the Reverend William John Zimmerman, a sexual predator who molested girls aged seven and eight. This is not, of course, not an isolated story of residential schools. As a result of the church's part in residential school violence, Indigenous Anglican leaders have called the church to repent. 
in these, quote, ancient and biblical concepts of repentance, repentance is the grace-filled motion within the human heart of the original and primal impulse to seek life in God. There are, however, distorted forms of individualized repentance and apology that can lead to continued attempts to assimilate people into institutions rather than doing the healing work of reconciliation. The claim is that these distorted forms of repentance can be overcome in part by learning how to repent corporately. Indigenous leaders have also made a connection between the church's corporate repentance and Canadian public life. Repentance in this case is, quote, offered to Canada in the fulfillment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission process. Reconciliation depends on the grace-filled motion of repentance operating within our individual hearts and within the various communities and institutions that make up Canadian life. There remain, however, significant barriers to repentance, and these strategies of settler avoidance take many forms, and about which there is a significant body of literature. Bird, for example, writes of settler agnosia. Tuck and Wang write of settler moves to innocence. Regan of the mythical quest to assuage colonizer guilt. Bimalastri, Pegues, and Goldstein of Settler Disavowal. Carrie and Scott Meyer of a mythical event horizon that obscures and eviscerates memory, producing the settler as innocent. And ends and Myers of Settler Strategies for Securing Innocence, to name just a few. Solutions often come with a call for responsibility. For Regan, it looks like intergenerational moral responsibilities that encompass past, present, and future relationships. For Cowrie and Scott Meyer, it is an accountability with contemporary actuality. For Enns and Myers, it is responsibility, uh, their neologism pun and portmanteau that combines the words response and ability. So I conclude this section uh, having introduced three things to grapple with. The first is the reality of Anglican Christian participation in a project of state and religious violence intended to, quote, get rid of the Indian problem by destroying indigenous lives, peoples, and cultures through abuse, exploitation, and death. The second is a call to repentance for this violence that is both corporate and reaches beyond the church into public life. And the third is the strategies of forgetting, misremembering, or construction of false narratives that create a sense of false innocence among settlers and the necessity of counter strategies to undermine that false innocence through truth, an appropriate sense of guilt, and the creation of a sense of responsibility. Section two, Dietrich Bonhoeffer on repentance. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German Lutheran theologian born in 1906, best known for his resistance to national socialism and his death in April 1945 in the Flossenburg uh, concentration camp. Bonhoeffer, though, was also an accomplished theologian. One of the foundational theological concepts for Bonhoeffer was Stellvertretung. In German culture more broadly, a Stellvertreter is someone who acts on another person's behalf. Bonhoeffer, however, deploys the concept theologically, where Stellvertretung becomes the foundational to Christ's work and our redemption. Christ stands in for us on the cross, thus the Stell and Stellvertretung from Stellen, the German verb to stand, Christ accomplishing what we cannot accomplish on, uh, on our own. Bonhoeffer, though, also deploys the concept he describes uh, the ways that members of the body of Christ can also stand in for one another and for Christ, representing others before God and representing Christ to others. In Bonhoeffer's earliest work, Stelvertretung centers around three acts of love, intercessory prayer, the mutual forgiveness of sins, and self-renouncing love for a neighbor. These acts of love for Bonhoeffer are each a way of acting as Christ for another, interceding, forgiving, and sacrifice, and a way to stand in for another before God. This brings us to vicarious repentance, one of Bonhoeffer's more under-researched theological concepts, uh, partly because he does not write of vicarious repentance in a systematic way. I mention, though, Bonhoeffer's acts of love because Bonhoeffer writes of repentance in similar terms. The primary similarity is that one can repent for another, much like one can pray, forgive, or act sacrificially for another. 
Vicarious repentance, however, also carries corporate significance for Bonhoeffer, with Bonhoeffer suggesting that repentance can be done on behalf of a whole community. Further, for Bonhoeffer, though the whole burden of guilt falls on Jesus Christ, Christians become the bearers of the sin and guilt for other people. As Christ bears our burdens, so we are able to bear the burden of our sisters and brothers. So for Bonhoeffer, repentance takes place in a way that as a re person repents for their own sin, they can also repent for others corporately. Further, an individual Christian can bear the sins of others as they stand in for the Christ who bears the sins of others. In the Guilt, Justification, Renewal Ethics Manuscript, written near the end of Bonhoeffer's life, Bonhoeffer addresses the connection between the Church's repentance and Christ's worldly Stelvertreten most succinctly. There, for Bonhoeffer, the renewal of the Church includes confession not only of its own sins, but the sins of the world. And as the Church confesses the sins of the world, he writes, the whole guilt of the world falls on the church, on Christians, and because here it is confessed and not denied, the possibility of forgiveness is opened. Free confession of guilt is not something that one can take or leave, says Bonhoeffer. It is the form of Jesus Christ breaking through in the church. The call to repentance outlined in section one presses the church to confess its sins corporately in such a way that repentance has public significance. We see this in Bonhoeffer's theology of repentance, where individual repentance is necessarily tied to the church's repentance. And as the church bears the guilt of the world, it does so as the Christ who bears the guilt of the world. And as the church bears the guilt of the world as Christ, it opens up the possibility of the forgiveness, not only of the sins of the church, but of the sins of the world. And though vicarious repentance might appear to be another settler move to innocence, at least if one were to understand that the repenting person remains innocent while repenting for the sins of others. The opposite, however, is true for Bonhoeffer. One can repent for others because one is taking on the guilt of others and truly bearing it. Besides, for Bonhoeffer, there is no innocent person, as all have need of repentance. So these are, as I presented them here, touch points in Bonhoeffer's theology and ones that constructively interact with the church's call to repentance and settler moves to innocence. There are certainly other next steps for this work and remaining questions. Incorporating truth-telling and listening would be helpful through Bonhoeffer's understanding of responsibility. And as the project develops in a more constructive direction, resources outside Bonhoeffer would give it greater breadth. A deeper engagement with scripture would be appropriate as well. Some manner of proposing concrete ends should be part of the process of repentance and where Bonhoeffer himself would be weak. And finally, a deeper investigation into the nature of the call to repentance will be needed as this work goes forward in order to avoid the now unreliable, unreliable teaching of former Archbishop Mark MacDonald. So to conclude, I return to my original questions. Is the church guilty? Yes, in part because it bears and shares the guilt and sin of its members, but also because it bears and shares the sin and guilt of the world. Can the church repent for the unrepentant perpetrators of abuse? Yes, because again, the church bears and shares the sin and guilt of its members. Further, because repentance is vicarious, even if it were only a small number of members who repented, those members can repent for the whole of the church community. So can one repent for others, at least for Bonhoeffer, most certainly, but only because Christ has already stood in for us, thus allowing members of his church to stand in for others before Christ and as Christ for others, as we recognize our own guilt and sin, and as we bear the guilt and sin of others. Thank you very much, Preston. Um, Let's go right on um, to Ryan Turnbull. Having grown up in a cattle ranch in Western Manitoba, Ryan Turnbull has a deep interest in the intersection of theology, decolonization, ecology, place, and friendship. He's currently located in Winnipeg and is pursuing a PhD in theology and religion at the University of Birmingham, focusing on Christian theologies of grace and their colonial entanglements. Over to you, Ryan. 
that's uh, Theologies of Place, actually. <clears throat> um, and this presentation is uh, from a chapter of my thesis um, where I'm trying to kind of use a case study from a community near where I grew up, St. Madeline, um, as a way of kind of digging into what's at stake when Christians theologize place in a way that doesn't kind of attend to some of the colonial contradictions in, in our theologizing of place. In his landmark encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si, Pope Francis remarked that the history of our friendship with God is always linked to particular places, which take on an intensely personal meaning. We all remember places and revisiting those memories does us much good. Yet the intensely personal meaning of places and our memories of places can also do much harm. I was raised on a small farm near Binsgarth, Manitoba, and the place always invokes memories of intense personal meaning. Yet until recently, I was completely unaware that the place where my people have lived and belonged for almost 140 years has another history, another set of memories. These are memories and a history that have been kept alive by some of my closest neighbors of a place and a community that once belonged to a Métis community, but had been destroyed to secure the place and prosperity of the European settler community of which I am a part. In the 1930s, the Canadian prairies were hit hard by both severe drought and the effects of the Great Depression. In response, the government of Canada created the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Administration in 1935, and work began to rescue settlers from ecological and financial ruin. A variety of measures were implemented, but in extreme situations, some lands were selected as being simply too fragile for cropping, and the decision was made to convert them to community pastures to prevent further soil erosion. There was much success with this policy in Saskatchewan, and by 1937, it was decided that this would be implemented in Manitoba as well. The St. Madeline district, down in the corner here, uh, a Métis community southwest of Binskreth, Manitoba, was selected for this pasture program. As devout Roman Catholics, the Métis of the region had worked closely with the church to establish St. Madeline as a Catholic mission around the turn of the century, but when the surrounding settler community decided upon its dissolution, the local priest sided with the settler community and removed community assets from the church for use in the nearby parish of St. Lazar. As the local paper, the Russell Banner noted in 1938, the establishment of these pastures was not without cost, including the removal of several families who lived in the townships designated for conversion to pasture land. Between 1938 and 1942, St. Madeline was dismantled. An alleged victory for governments who championed progressive technological solutions to the problems of settler society, but yet another defeat for the indigenous peoples whose land this had been from time immemorial. Those who were paid up on their taxes were remunerated with cash payouts or scrip for land elsewhere in the municipality, but given the economic conditions of the time, few qualified for the payouts, and most were simply forced to leave. The houses were burnt, the dogs were shot, the church was dismantled, and most of the community either had to disperse or ended up settling in two road allowance settlements, known colloquially as Selby Town and Fulliard's Corner. The Métis community of St. Madeline was no more. But the European settler residents of the rural municipality of Ellis now had access to abundant, cheap pasture land. While the former residents of St. Madeline had to live with the trauma of forced displacement, the surrounding settler communities insulated themselves from this reality, focusing instead on the relief that the new pasture land provided for a drought stricken community. Very few settler sources even mention the dissolution of St. Madeline. The local papers reported in minute detail on the type of grass being planted, the amount of fence being built. There was even a feature article about people going to visit the new pastures as a social outing, something that my family did quite a lot of times when I was growing up. St. Madeline and its destruction are not mentioned in the pages of these local papers until 50 years later in 1987. In the local community history book project entitled Binsgarth Memories, St. Madeline is mentioned, and its end is attributed to the arrival of the community pastures. Yet there is no hint that this ending was characterized in the slightest by any conflict. In fact, in the 1984 volume, the St. Madeline entry is even penned by a former resident of St. Madeline, Joseph Boucher, 
Yet the end of the community's existence is just stated flatly. In 1938, the government started to make the community pasture. By 1939, a lot of people moved to other places. The community pasture was open to farmers to graze cattle in 1940. The records contained in the local papers and history books are a product of a structure called settler colonialism. Settler colonialism is a structure of power that seeks to naturalize itself, to remember itself as the natural and normal structure of reality such that its violent, extractive and colonial roots disappear. If the violence of the past is raised, it is merely as a sad chapter in our history and not an ongoing structural violence. Canadian col settler colonialism remembers in a way that carefully edits out the violent histories that created its dominance in the first place. It is not simply that settler Canadians have forgotten our own violent histories. Rather, it is that settler colonialism gives legitimacy to a remembering process that makes decisions about what counts as history at all. What counts is worthy of remembering. In the case of St. Madeline, what was worth remembering to settlers was the achievement of a new community pasture not the trauma and, faint and pain of forced displacement. The agrarian settlers of my home community, with the support of their colonial governments, thought that burning the houses and shooting the dogs of St. Madeline would cause the Métis to disappear, remaining only as ghosts and grave markers in the corner of a community pasture. Tragically, even the church that had been co-constitutive of St. Madeline was unable or unwilling to stand in solidarity with the Métis through the dissolution of their community. But the Métis of St. Madeline are no mere ghosts. They continue to use the land. They continue to visit and maintain the cemetery. And since 1990, they have held an annual festival of Métis identity at, at the old site of every summer. St. Madeline and its people continue to persist, haunting the consciousness of settler colonialism by resisting settler efforts to misremember them into oblivion. The Settler Society of Canada may seek to obscure and naturalize its origins, but the people of St. Madeline continue to be a presence in the land that point to a different vision of political economy of the land. One that invites us into good relations with kin who have for far too long been regarded as spectral enemies. Belonging to a place is to at once be haunted and held by the memories and histories of that place. Pope Francis is right. Revisiting the memories of a place is a good idea but we should be prepared to be unsettled by the presence of relationships and histories that Christian complicity with settler colonialism has long sought to unknow. It is time to unforget the presence of, of all our relations, settler and indigenous, and to work to build a future where all have a place in this land, even if that means giving some land back. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, there, Ryan. Um, a moment there for appreciation for our speakers. Thank you to each of them for their presentations. And are there any questions? We have a uh, oh, good 15 minutes for a conversation. There's one in the chat from James. Um, oh, thank this, you very much. Yeah, what is the Go source ahead. for Bonhoeffer's thoughts? Um, uh, uh, scripture and experience, I suppose, is, is 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 what I'd say. If you mean that sort of source, if you mean source in Bonhoeffer, it, it, mostly what I was referring to was uh, Sanctorum Communio, which is his first work, and then his latest uh, work, uh, his latest work before his his letters, at least in from prison, um, his uh, his ethics manuscript. Any comment among the speakers uh, about the papers? And while you're thinking about that, there's a question from Doris. Sorry, that took a second. Um, I, this is a question, I guess, for Jeremy in particular, talking about martyrdom and trauma and whatnot. Um, do you, have you seen any connections uh, between feminist scholarship around um, trauma, violence, and abuse, and the ways in which that gets um, sort of categorized and, and uh, shaped in 
church dialogue around martyrdom and victimization and whatnot. Because I think there might be some rich um, resources there. Yeah, excellent uh, question. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I mean, overall, I've been somewhat surprised that there have not been more explicit links uh, sort of between sort of uh, trauma and martyrdom. Um, and, and so there, there, isn't, there isn't quite the, the very obvious answer. But I mean, I'm thinking of the work of, of Hilary Scarcella and others who talk about sort of Eucharistic uh, imagery and 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 the cross as uh, what kind of impact uh, those those stories and and those those practices may have for victims of various kinds of, of violence, particularly sexual violence. So I think there there are there is some of that, but um, but unlike unlike for example the way a, a trauma lens has been applied, for example, in, in biblical studies fields, uh, I. You know, and as well as, of course, in in more pastoral kinds of uh, kinds of settings, I, there there seems to be a bit of a gap uh, with the explicit link with martyrdom, but definitely feminist sources to to draw on for for making those connections. Great, thanks for the question and the response. Patrick Nolan has a question. Thanks everyone for the presentations. Uh, it's a question and a little bit more of a, a comment for Ryan. It was a great presentation to show kind of the history of a uh, specific community in our larger conversation. I'd be curious, and again, in 10 minutes, I know you can't show all the past research, and but if you've uh, delved into any of Derrida on this on hauntology, uh, the connections that could be made with the idea of a location and Concretizing Daddy does thoughts on this for a kind of spatial land, I think would be really fruitful and really interesting. So I'm just curious if anything of that has been ex explored before and if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, hauntology is like my main method, and that's a whole um, chapter in itself. Um, but kind of, yeah, Derrida and, and Mark Fisher are kind of um, two kind of major voices there. But there has been actually, so uh, I'm still working on that and, and <laughs> get back to me in about a year when I'll actually have this all kind of wrapped up. But um, there, there has been some in really interesting work in like geography of, of applying hauntology to sites in South Africa, um, particularly stuff around kind of like seeing the trace and that kind of thing. So overseeing, um, you know, like where uh, different kind of structures from apartheid were. Um, and kind of being able to kind of use imaging technology and stuff to see some of this. So there's really cool stuff um, being done in this area. And that was kind of uh, why I thought that that would be a fitting method for, for um, St. Madeline. Plus the fact that, you know, basically all that remains of this specific site is a cemetery. So kind of like right there, it's just a very rich. Um, yeah. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Andrew, a question. Uh, my question is for Preston. Uh, so I'm curious when you're looking at, I mean, uh, this could be a question about Bonhoeffer or it could be a question to you specifically, and I'm happy for you to answer it either way. Um, so what does it mean for him, I suppose, or for you to, to bear sin? Because when I think of Christ bearing sin, I think of it personally as a salvific act um, that is going to bring salvation for me. Um, and then... Um, I'm thinking, I'm also, I guess it's probably more about what Bonhoeffer's thinking, but is, it, is he speaking of a general repentance or repentance from specific acts of sin? Because I think, okay, I, I could kind of see myself repenting as I apologize for my child's act of acting out at, you know, the grocery store. But I would feel odd for me to repent for something that you've done where I have no proximity to you in relationship. I've never met you before. Um, so, yeah, what is it? Is it general repentance, specific acts, and what does it mean to bear sin in, in your presentation? Yeah, so, yeah, thank you. That's, uh, there's, um, so, Stavitrating or, uh, you know, acting as a deputy for another works in, in two ways for Bonhoeffer. And, and the primary one is in Christ's redemption, right? This is universal. This is for the sake of all of humanity. This is a, a, a general sort of a thing. Um, but because Bonhoeffer holds, um, other uh, especially paul on the body of christ so high is that he does um 
he kind of flips back and forth as just how redemptive it is, but he does speak clearly on the fact that we can, um, in Christ's place, uh, uh, truly forgive the sins of others, for example, right? Um, and but this is a this is a dependent on Christ's work already, but it is work that continues in the church, right? Um, in a but in a in a creaturely way, right? So as 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 take the, the example of forgiveness of sins, right? So Christ's work would be for the forgiveness of the sins of the world, um, but in in our own uh, asking for forgiveness, it's 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 creaturely and limited to uh, those things which we would name, right? Um, and uh, where I'm landing with uh, this kind of constructive use of Bonhoeffer is that indeed you could repent for uh, my sins uh, so long as we are clear that uh, we are the body of Christ and the body of the Christ who uh, who does bear the sins and guilt of others right um, and so it's uh, it's it's uh, and, and Bonhoeffer says this quite specifically we do bear the sins and guilt of uh, of others um, in the body of Christ, just as Christ bears the sins of the, and, and guilt of the world. Um, the connection between that bearing and the repenting is, is kind of a missing link, um, but, uh, but, but there, there, there you have at least some thoughts on it. Is that, is that helpful? Uh, or, yeah, I lost you there. Great, thank you. Uh, Alan. Thanks everyone for great papers. Um, a question for Ryan, um, an observation and a question. I'm just intrigued, uh, first of all, uh, by your paper in general. A um, couple of things that really uh, struck me is how significant is it um, that this these lands became uh, communal pastures as opposed to farms for farmers? Um, and how does that play into the narrative that's being told in a sort of a self-justifying way? Uh, the other one that sort of, I really like this haunting piece, so I really want to think more about that. I really, really think, find that could be generative and helpful. I'm also intrigued by the way you described um, the continued presence of the Métis um, and attending to the graves, being present. So in addition to the haunting, there's people bearing witness to that haunting, and I don't know how they play into the thing, but I really thought that there's some um, some really powerful motifs there. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so like literally some of my closest neighbors uh, were Bouchers and they were like a very prominent family there. And and I go to church with them. And actually I I ended up talking to to one of the kind of patriarchs of that family recently and he gave me a bunch of other stuff. Um, and it's interesting to hear kind of their perspective on it. Um, I didn't have ethics approval to kind of use those conversations. So um, but, um, yeah, they, the thing that Vine Deloria points out, I think it's him, is that, you know, settlers really like uh, a quote unquote Indian graveyard, because that means that Indigenous people are dead and gone, and that we can kind of be their spiritual inheritance. So we really like that, and it shows up all over our media. Uh, but the problem is they're not dead and gone, right? So they're still there. And I think... Um, one of the things I was kind of trying to play with is this idea that, you know, you've got this cemetery there, this kind of a haunting thing, but yet it doesn't represent that they're gone. They actually didn't, um, as much as kind of like uh, the local council wrote to the provincial government about trying to get rid of this community, they didn't actually really succeed. They just kind of displaced them. And now they're like still actually prominent members of the community. So there's this kind of... Um, tension there but it's it's really tough to untangle because i'm trying to look at my own home uh from you know yeah make it strange to myself which is which is always really emotionally difficult to do great thank you very much uh jeremy uh, if i if i could ask a question here just as, a, as an audience member of a fellow, fellow panelist um i'm actually interested uh preston in some of your comments both on repentance but then also forgiveness and so uh, I'm wondering you know in in how particularly how Bonhoeffer thinks about forgiveness and so on I mean uh, and the very Christological way that you're 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 thinking about repentance I mean what are, are there dangers that you see in kind of the church 
you know, which is, which is, uh, you know, seeking to do a corporate repentance, also understanding itself as forgiven yeah. in a way yeah. that can kind of do an end run around the more uh, communal or interpersonal kind of, of processes that, um, that might be short circuited by simply understanding ourselves as, as forgiven. And so how do you, how do you think about the dynamics of forgiveness uh, in particular with respect to residential schools? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know yet. Um, but, but definitely it's, it's a, it's a gap there, right? Like there's the risk uh, just in what I've said of, of creating some sort of environment where the church absolves itself. Right. Um, and, and that's, that's, that's not, it's not the intention. Um, however, having, having, having said that part of the genesis of this, of, of this work is, is very, very specific to St. John's in Kitchener. Um, so when, uh, when we were, um, when, the ground penetrating radar was showing uh, graves and, and it was coming to public awareness. Um, we, uh, I, there's a group of young adults who just really wanted to do something, you know, what can we do? What, what, how can we begin some, some sort of task of some reconciliatory task? Uh, and so we invited Roz Elm, who is the archdeacon for uh, indigenous ministries and reconciliation in the diocese. Um, so we invited her to say, Hey Roz, you know, what can we do? And she said, uh, work on your own healing, right? So, um, so part of this is growing out of a very uh, sort of uh, in, internal reflection on guilt and sin, um, and in some efforts um, at beginning some sort of healing process. Um, uh, um, you, you know, I mean, we do. If we were to repent of specific sins now, um, I mean, uh, we as we continue to benefit from. Um, uh, from what happened to this land, right? I mean, we, there's material benefit for St. John sitting on a piece of land in which uh, we never gave the money back uh, to Six Nations, um, where it was intended to be a, a perpetual lease, right? That little piece of land where we are. Um, so we're materially benefiting from it. Um, and so repentance for that, awareness of that. But the forgiveness part is is not, is not, uh, that that piece is not in in this work yet how how we would do that but it would i think necessarily have to come with uh, significant truth telling um and and uh, reparation of relationships hopefully through that um so i bonhoeffer doesn't really give those resources and that's where the breadth of this project needs to there's some breadth is needed for it because uh, he's not really good on on that particular thing he does have a notion of responsibility which is um, very much uh, a kind of a listening and responding um, concept for for uh, for the church, and I think there there might be a little bit there um, as I as I move forward. Great, thank you. We might have time for one more question, but there's nothing wrong with uh, just appreciating our speakers. Uh, maybe have a moment of appreciation and maybe even one minute before we have to begin the next panel discussion. So maybe I will just say thank you very much, invite us all to express our gratitude, and we'll turn this over to panel number four. Thanks very much.